Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising. Humanity Rising is an initiative of Ubiquity University and over 350 partnering organizations from all over the world that have come together through this extraordinary pandemic to provide an open space, a common ground, a sacred space for people all around the world to share their experiences, to share their dreams, their aspirations, their solutions, and their strategies for how we can work together more effectively to ensure a better world. We made the commitment right at the beginning when we started in May 22nd that we would continue for as long as the pandemic. Alas, here we are uh, in November and the pandemic is going very strong uh, in every region of the world. And people are laboring. Uh, people are tired. Uh, people just want this to be over and it's not. And all manner of exigencies are now inflicting themselves on our lives from lockdown to social distancing and most tragically escalating death rates and both the United States and in the European Union uh, there's about one person dying uh, every 60 seconds or so and so Last Friday, uh, we decided we were just going to pause. And after discussing virtually every imaginable issue, from economics to science, to culture, to politics, to environment, we thought, let us just pause and bear witness to our grief. You know, oftentimes we read the news and we hear about some crisis or the extinction of some species or the violation of some girl or some tragedy around race, despoilation of nature. And we react in anger and despair and we want to do something about it. We want to attack the citadel. We want to storm the barricades. But sometimes it's just more important to take a minute or two, a day or two, a week or two, and simply feel the grief of the world we have created and in which this scourge of the pandemic is laying siege to our cultures, our communities, our families. In the United States, it's Thanksgiving this week and we're being told not to gather in anything but the smallest of numbers. What does Thanksgiving mean without community? What does community mean without the ability to touch one another? Anger, activism blocks our grief. You have to rest in the stillness to feel the grief. It hit me actually last week with the news about the minks in Finland. Somehow or other, the human virus 
affected the mink colonies in Finland of all places and of all species. And then a virulent form from the minks began to infect humans. And the response of the Finnish government was to say, let's just annihilate all the minks. 12.5 million minks. And I thought, how are they going to possibly do that? Not one, not hundreds, not thousands, but millions. How do you kill millions of animals? And I felt such a deep sorrow for our time and such a deep grief for other sentient beings. I haven't been able to get them out of my mind. And so today we wanna to continue our reflection on the depth of grief and how somehow in a way beyond our capacity to fully understand Grief can grace us with a deeper sense of vulnerability and affinity and compassion and caring and tenderness for the fragility that has become our lives. So thank you everyone for joining us. And I would like to now uh, turn it over to my good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Kayleen Asbo, uh, who will uh, commence our program. Kayleen, welcome. Thank you so much, Jim. And you use the phrase grief and grace in the same sentence. And that is what today is all about. This is part two of a two part uh, I almost think of it as an introductory series that we wanted to offer. And I've been so grateful that I've been able to gather some of the wise elders of ritual who have been profound leaders in the art, the art of grief. So last Friday, psychotherapist Francis Weller spoke about the material that he's collected over a lifetime of study, a lifetime of building community of what I would call the alchemical work of transmutation. And in order to do this transmutation, to take, to take the, the prima materia that we're all immersed in right now, we might even call it the swamp of despair. And in order to do that, we have to acknowledge, we have to turn towards it. We have a cultural aversion to running away, to locking away our sorrows, but today, Today is a celebration of those throughout history and people through our own time who have been able to alchemize grief, who've been able to take death, disaster, despair, even disgrace, and to go down so deeply inside of them that they've been able to transmute that, that to, to take that material and turn it into beauty. And in the act of taking what is inside of you and bringing it forth, bringing it forth in the arts, in words, in images, in music, something, I'll use the word magical, happens. And the sting, it's not that the grief goes away completely. There can still be sorrow. But now, in the words of William Blake and the writings of Francis Weller, now both hands are full. And now we can hold the sorrows in the world, but, but we can also feel such gratitude, such love 
The poet Khalil Gibran said, the deeper sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. I would actually suggest looking at the history of artists and composers from Artemisia Gentileschi to Ludwig van Beethoven and Johann Sebastian Bach and poets like Breiner Maria Rilke, that we might say the deeper sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can create. Francis Weller spoke on Friday about being initiated into the Dagara tribe by Maladoma Somme in West Africa, in Burkina Faso. And one of the things that he noticed that really struck him is that when he went through the village, the faces were radiant and he asked, a woman, you, you glow with radiance and joy. Why, how can that be? You know, things here are so difficult. There's so much poverty. There's so much mortality, but you exude joy. And she said, oh yes, that is because I cry often. So many of us are afraid of our tears, but if we turn our tears if we turn our tears into words and images and poems, something magical happens both inside us and around us. So to begin with, this dance, this dialogue between gratitude and grief, Francis, in my years working with him, he, he would often re repeat this phrase that yes, the sorrow is horrible, the minx is tragic, but did we also have the eyes to see? Did we also have the eyes to see this morning the way that the frost kissed the leaves and outlined them? Did we have the eyes to see the Japanese maple all in flame with fluttering yellow leaves falling to the ground? Did we also have the presence of mind to smell the crisp clean air or last night? to see the moonshine gently bathing us with light? Did we have the eyes to see, to hear the look of love, even if it was only on Zoom, to feel a poem enter us deeply? So as we begin, I want to invite you, those of you who are listening, especially live, to put your hands on your heart and to breathe in deeply, and it may be difficult if you've been immersed in the news, if you've been inundated by the headlines, but I wanna invite you to dig deeply within, to breathe deeply and to remember, what have you seen? What have you heard? What have you felt or maybe even tasted? that was beautiful, that was good, and that was true. And I wanna invite those of you who are listening live to actually put it in the chat box. What have you known? What have you known just in the past 24 hours? Find it, find the thread. This is so important. In Francis's work, he talks about amnesia and anesthesia being the two deadliest conditions of the modern age. We forget and we go numb. And all the spiritual traditions of the world would tell us, wake up, wake up right now, because there is still beauty. There is still beauty everywhere. Each morning there's a sunrise. Every evening there's a sunset. In Alice Walker's book, The Color Purple, she says, you know, God paints a masterpiece every day and most people don't ever see it. In the play of Auntie Mame, life is a banquet and most poor people are starving to death. There is grief all around, but there is also the grace of the waxing and waning moon and the stars the grace of the rainfall, new blades shooting up from the earth, the joy of planting daffodils in the dark soil. 
And our salvation, our transformation might depend on remembering. We will have to turn and face the sorrows, but we will also need to remember. To remember and to celebrate. Ayo, 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 ayo. One of the great practices we can engage in is before we pick up the morning news headlines to read a poem. My two favorite living poets are Rosemary Watola Traumer, who writes a poem every day, and Mark Nepo, whose work is so essential in the transmutation of grief to grace. His own difficult journey was one that he encountered two bouts of cancer and divorce and numerous other losses. And my dear friend Taylor Lampson introduced me to his poem as we were planning a grief ritual. I wanna invite Taylor to share this poem which speaks to all of us for what we're invited to, to turn loss into beauty, to take grief into compassion to take disaster and alchemically work its wonder to come together in a new way. Taylor, if you would, please. Fighting the Instrument by Mark Nepo. Often the instruments of change are not kind or just. And the hardest openness of all might be to embrace the change while not wasting your heart fighting the instrument. The storm is not as important as the path it opens. The mistreatment in one life never as crucial as the clearing it makes in your heart. This is very difficult to accept. The hammer or cruel one is always short-lived compared to the jewel in the center of the stone. Thank you, Taylor. So today what we're going to do is we're going to start by sharing a little bit of part two of the work developed by Francis Weller and then passed on. And that is this idea of creating rituals of both grief and gratitude so that we be, can become ripe, spiritually mature, able to stand and face the suffering of the world, but also not to be crushed by it, to open our hearts to the possibilities of new life. So Taylor is going to share a little bit about grief rituals, and then we're going to turn to some of the stories of our artistic ancestors Bach and Bougereau and Dante, just a few of these, and then a contemporary photographer. And then we'll close today with suggestions of what you can do, how you can ignite the creative spark inside of yourself to turn what could be a period of deprivation and lockdown, actually to alchemically work it, transmute it, to become a doorway to opening, to a breakthrough not a lockdown. So Taylor, last Friday when Francis spoke, there were a few things that he articulated and this can all be found both on the, the Rick is going to give us a link to part one, but also Francis Weller's wonderful book, The Wild Edge of Sorrow. And one of the most important aspects of his work is to underscore that there are gates of grief. We have our personal grief, but we also have a collective grief. You know, Jim just spoke to his grief about the minks, about 
ecocide, about environmental destruction. That's something that so many of us are waking up to. The grief about Black Lives Matter, the grief about the conflicts between people in our countries and in the world that, that break our hearts, that feel so exquisitely anguished. Many of us are for the first time fe feeling a grief about ancestral wounds. Thomas Hubble's magnificent work focuses so much on ancestral wounds. And I know that many of us, Thanksgiving used to be something we, we took for granted in two ways as a celebration of the pilgrims. But in America, many of us can't do that anymore because we've woken up to that, yes, the pilgrims survived, but the cost of that was horrific for the indigenous people of this country. So there is a grief and a gratitude now that actually are both at our empty tables. And this idea that grief must be shared, that, that in order not to get stuck inside of us, you know, we have that idea that when tears are stuck in our throat, we call it globus hystericus. And then we become frozen. And in order to move through us, we need to share together. So Francis's gates of grief find expression in the rituals that he has created and that you also have adapted, roots that have its roots, a, a, a ritual that has its roots with Maladoma and Sabon Fusome's work, which they brought to this country from West Africa and shared so generously of heart. And what I'd love for you to speak about, Taylor, very briefly, is this, this message of gratitude and grief side by side with beauty and the ways that you set up a grief ritual and what you have seen in that process as hospice worker, counselor, practitioner. I would say Francis says that we all need to do an apprenticeship with grief. And I know for about 15 years, you have been doing a long, deep apprenticeship with grief in many ways. So it's my great pleasure, everyone, to introduce my dear friend, Taylor Lampson, who is a life path coach and a grief worker. And if you will share about these grief rituals, Taylor. Yes, thank you, Kayleen. And uh, that was a beautiful introduction by Jim. I just wanna reiterate uh, this time uh, is a time for, for pausing and that we need to give ourselves space for this. And it can feel like we're going into an abyss that's bottomless. Um, so we need these tools that I'm gonna describe when we do a ritual to help us all gather together and, and join and support each other. Because grief is a solitary journey we cannot do alone. We've been taught that we're supposed to do it alone or that there's some shame around it. But in my experience, what I've found is when I can share my grief amongst others, it gets released in a different kind of way. And I get affirmed for myself and I realized that this is common ground that we all share. And all of us have had some loss in our life. So how do we hold the truth of our pain with compassion in one hand and the truth of our beauty with joy in the other hand? And this is what Kayleen is talking about. How do we bring these two together, grief and gratitude? to find some balance, to find some way of stretching ourselves big enough to hold both. Because if we can do that, what I've found in my own experience and with people in the grief rituals is that when they're able to, to fully dive into their grief and have it be witnessed and contained, the joy emerges by the end of it there is joy because if we're blocking one emotion grief or sadness or sorrows it tends to block the positive emotions like joy so just taking a deep breath realizing that this is our truth for all of us and the more we can support each other, as Kayleen described, the better off we all are. So I'm just gonna briefly describe some of the, the tools that we use in the grief ritual. I like to start off by 
saying names around the circle, having each person be acknowledged for who they are as a person and that they are worthy and that their sorrow matters. It doesn't matter what the sorrow is or how traumatic it is or how it compares to other people in the room. We just say our name and sometimes we say why we came. And that's a way of inviting more vulnerability as Jim talked about more uh, truth to come out so that we don't have to hide anymore. It's not, it's not something we need to hide. So we do some breathing exercises, deep breathing exercises like I'm doing now. And then I offer a song usually. Um, and singing allows for the breath, as you'll see later, if we do more singing with Doug, allows for the breath to be released out. And that in itself is healing. So we sing and we, we sometimes drum as well while we're singing. And then we move into a place of quiet and we just let that sit and settle in. And then we move into usually a poem or grief sharing. If someone has something that comes up, they wanna share with the group that they feel is relevant. And then we go into small groups and do uh, sharings that are more intimate. So we don't have to feel like we're sharing this huge element of ourselves that's so vulnerable to the whole group. And we use shuttles or their writing shuttles or their prompts that we give people. And what we do is we write out a prompt, for example, this is what I'm feeling, or I am sad because. And what we found is by writing out, it taps into something that is beyond our mind. And we go into our bodies because our bodies remember these wounds that are stored in our, in our souls. And so by writing, it releases some of that. And then, we all bring a, an, a sacred object uh, to build a shrine to honor both our own pieces and the communal pieces, the ancestors, pictures of people that we've lost, whatever sacred item uh, that we wanna bring to share with others, to let them know this is precious. This is precious or was precious to me and it's worthy of my grief because I loved so much. And this is, this is where the power of the ritual comes in. As we go into a ritual after making the shrine, the drumming starts and the singing starts. And sometimes the shrine becomes a wailing wall where people can go and release whatever they need to release. And that can be all different emotions, not just crying. Rage tends to, to show up a lot. And underneath most of those emotions tends to be grief. And once we can release that and acknowledge that in a communal way, uh, it's one of the most powerful healing modalities that I've ever experienced. So we, we do this all in community and then we come back to the community after we, after we go to the shrine and offer our tears um, to the community. We come back and we, we hold each other. Hard to do in the times of COVID, but we hold each other and just acknowledge that what work we've done is not just for us, but for all the ancestors and our community and everyone that we've ever encountered. And it's a healing balm and that's how we find the beauty in this seemingly bottomless pit or abyss is by coming together and seeing each other, seeing each other maybe for the first time in this way, our humanity is revealed and it, it is a beautiful thing. 
when we feel like we've been seen and heard. So that gives you some idea of the work I've done uh, with grief rituals and I have worked with Francis and uh, it's been a very powerful journey, both personally and for the community. Tyler, one of the things that <clears throat> always touches my heart and I think needs to be underscored is that in these rituals, you are never alone. So that it, it, it is an invitation to feel, really feel, to give yourself permission to fully feel what you're feeling and have it be okay. You know, we live in a culture, the anesthesia of our culture is that so many of us for our whole lifetimes have been wearing a mask. It's not just now, but it's, it's the culture where people have said, you know, how are you doing? And how many of you have said, how many, many of you have said in your lifetime, oh, I'm fine, when actually you've just been fired or you've gotten news of cancer or something terrible has happened in your life. And we've all been wearing masks. Our culture has been wearing masks where we haven't told the truth about what is real inside of us. And many of us feel like we can't tell the truth because they, we say, well, nobody around me wants to hear that or I can't do that. Or as Francis says, I'm afraid that if I speak the truth, I'll start crying. And if I start crying, I'll never stop. So it's just amazing that the beauty enables this container. And Taylor, you've created such beauty in your rituals, you know, the beauty of song, the beauty of nature being brought in with flowers, with the shrine, and the beauty of the writing practices and the poetry. So as Francis often says, poet, you know, beauty coaxes the, the soul out of its shy place. So starting with that place of beauty allows us to feel safe. And then, you know, one of the poems that you so often read is Wild Geese of Tell Me Despair Yours and I Will Tell You Mine by Mary Oliver. And that's such a beautiful motto for us in this time. And Taylor, one of the things that is so powerful then about when, when the wave of grief actually hits is it starts with a song. And I don't know if you can sing the song, um, you or Doug, um, so that we have just a taste, but this song that was born out of sorrow and disaster in Burkina Faso. Um, and the song gets repeated over and over and over as long as it takes for every tear to be shed. And I've been in grief rituals where the ritual itself takes two hours. And I've been in rituals where it takes four hours for all the tears to be shed. And we, it's a timeless place. But as everyone, as the whole community circles around and sings this song, when the wave crashes over you, could you describe what happens with the companioning to the altar? Because that is so important just to hold as an image in our mind, even in these COVID times. Can you talk about that, about the witnessing and the welcoming back in this ritual? Yes, thank you. Um, it's hard to distill all of this that happens in the ritual into a, a short period of time. And we do sing a song that came from Africa and I would invite us to sing that uh, with our song master who happens to be with us today. It's called Pura Samane. And so once we're singing this song, sometimes for hours and hours and the drumming continues and this drum beat matches our heart and we feel this community coming together like you said witnessing each other and we actually when we embrace we actually say i see you i heard you thank you for doing the work you've done and this creates this beautiful beautiful sense of community and what maladomas would say is it's a little village that we're creating, actually. It's a temporary village. When people come together and honor each other in that way, they become known to each other. And it's so intimate that some, sometimes it's hard. It's hard for people to really take in that level of intimacy. And yet, when they finally do, when they see that this is what we're meant to do, as people, is to come together, witness and support each other for the healing. 
it's so beautiful and so inspiring to see people come together and say, yes, I feel your pain and I honor you and I see you. Doug, would you sing the song for us? Yes. <clears throat> we'll invite everyone to stay muted, but to sing along if they wish. You'll hear Pura Samane and Pura Mamane. And it is a grandmother, grandfather, so old. Pura Samane, Pura Samane. Pura Same, oh, Pura Same, Pura Same, Pura Mamane, Pura Mamane, Pura Mamane, oh, Pura Mamane, Pura Mamane. And so it's um, Thank you, Doug. Hours on end. Thank you, Doug. I dream, I hope that this dream will, will somehow also infect Jim, that we could have a global conference on the arts of grief and invite Maladoma Somme and Thomas Hubel and our brothers and sisters with their wisdom that come from Asia and India and Africa and the deep south and and what would that be like if we gathered globally to share our tears? What would it be like if we could say, this, these are the practices of my people to deal with grief. Let me tell you about despair mine, and you tell me yours, and we will find our way in the family of things. So I want to share a little bit about this alchemy of grief and how this is happened throughout the centuries in, and show you some images and tell you a few stories and play for you a song that was met, created in the depth of despair. And this, this I think speaks so beautifully to this. This is a photograph by Thomas Dodd and you can see the image of the dearly loved departed and this idea of singing the songs, playing our songs. You know, Dorothy Parker once quipped, writing is easy, all you have to do is open a vein and bleed. And you can open your heart. And we think of that wonderful film, The Red Violin, which was painted with tears and blood of the violin maker's deceased wife. And the songs that came out of that, and that is the alchemical journey. You know, that line from the Gospel of Thomas that was found again, written probably in the year 50, and then, and then rediscovered in the depth of World War II in 1945, if you bring forth what is inside of you, what is inside of you will save you. If you don't bring forth what is inside of you, what is inside of you might destroy you or will destroy you. So Rick, thank you. That was exactly right to pull up this videotape. What you're about to hear is a bit of a piece written in the depths of despair. It's a piece of music written by Johann Sebastian Bach after he came home and found that his beloved wife had died and was buried while he was essentially on a business trip. And he poured his broken heart into the writing of this piece. You know, it would take a whole two hour lecture to give justice to the symbolism and the significance and the structure of this incredible work, which is known as the Chacon in D minor. In essence, it is variations on grief. It starts and it ends with what's known as a ground bass, just a simple chord progression that is played by this one solo violin. And then it goes through 64 variations. And those variations give rise to all aspects of grief because grief, as Taylor said, isn't just sorrow. It can also be rage. It can also be regret. It can also have moments of sweetness. It can also even have moments of, of remembrance of joy and all of that. And it can have hope of consolation in the future. 
if, as in Bach's case, he was a fervent Lutheran who believed that he would one day see his beloved wife again. And so here, here in this piece, we're just going to hear about a minute of it. This is my cherished friend, Nigel Armstrong, an amazing young violinist who is spending most of the lockdown, I believe, meditating. He's connected deeply with Thich Nhat Hanh's uh, community of Plum Village. And you're going to hear a performance that, uh, that was filmed elsewhere, but a year ago, a year ago, I was in this abbey in Iona and he played this piece during the storms and, and set up at the altar was actually a whole lamentation of grief for the planet. There were cards that had been written by pilgrims about their sorrow and their tears for the earth and for its creatures. There were symbols of, of the, the animals that were going extinct. There were prayers that were written for the ravaged places of the world. There was a prayer that was placed at the altar for the children who had been ripped from the arms of their parents at the border uh, in Mexico. And so surrounded by all of these prayers and by candles, there was this terrific storm outside and there was flashes of thunder and lightning and Nigel played this piece, the Chacon that Bach had written in the depth of his own despair in his grief. It's his great grief cry. And you're going to hear part of this as the violin rages and sobs and then comes to rest again. And I, I want to invite you, you can watch the videotape of Nigel playing it, or you can close your eyes and connect to your own story of your great grief cry, as Rilke would call it, and let this great grief cry of Bach flow through you just for a few minutes. There's a link to the entire performance of this that you'll find in the chat box and it's available on YouTube to hear Bach's great grief cry. And this great grief cry that came from the depth of his sorrow, his broken open heart, this was that very jewel in the center of the stone of that poem by Mark Nepo that Taylor wrote read for us that jewel in the center of the stone in the fighting the instrument and so what we have in the history of the arts is this amazing capacity this amazing capacity to transmute and that bach was able to go from the grief of that and go through it to the depths of it what he wrote in his violin had never been written. He did things that a violinist, I mean, it was thought to be unplayable for almost a hundred years. And it was actually going to Scotland with Joseph Joachim and Mendelssohn that this piece was first brought to the larger world because it was thought to be unplayable. 
And what it was, was that great grief cry. The great grief cry of Bach pouring everything from his broken heart into this. And when he did that, he really embodied this archetype of Orpheus. Orpheus in Greek mythology was the world's first musician and poet. And when he lost his wife, he couldn't bear it. And so he took his instrument and he descended into the depths of hell where he poured out his broken heart before Hades and Persephone. And in so doing, he moved, he moved even the Lord and lady of the underworld to restore to life the woman that he loved. The power of his grief song changed the world. It diverted rivers from their courses. It made animals who were in antagonism with one another, the lion and the lamb lay down together. And that archetypal image of, of pouring out your soul's cry of grief, when people have connected to that over and over again, it changes their life. Rainer Maria Rilke, who wrote the poem Pushing Through that Francis quoted last Friday, make yourself fierce and let it break in. Then your great, great transforming will happen to me and my great grief cry will happen to you. Rilke wrote that poem after World War I, after his own grief, and he was sitting in Chateau Museau in Switzerland when someone pinned up a picture of Orpheus and where a young violinist arrived to play that very song. And it broke through, it broke through his walls, it broke through his, 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 his amnesia, it broke through his, um, his numbness. And the sonnets to Orpheus in the second book of Dueno Elegies poured out of him in response to Bach's great grief cry. And part of what he was connecting to is the memory of this statue that you see here, which was done by Rodin. Because the sculptor Rodin had been his employer before and, and the great poet Rilke had been the creative secretary, if you will, when Rilke and Camille Claudel were working on their two monumental sculptures, the Burgers of Calais, which is itself a depiction of all the ways that human beings confront death. And you can see in their faces anger, denial, fear, bargaining, and acceptance. Well before Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote about this in a psychological book, Rodin and Camille Claudel sculpted it in stone. And this image that you see was one that, Ro that Rodin was working on when Rilke was his secretary. It is of Orpheus here covering his eyes as he makes his way through the underworld and his, the voice of his lost beloved, his lost beloved Eurydice singing in his ears. And it was the memory it was the remembering of this seed of beauty from long ago connected to Bach's great cry of grief that created the songs that poured out of Rilke, the great poetic volumes. Now that, that image that you see here was originally intended by Rodin to be parts of the gates of hell. Rodin's epic sculpture here, which was an epic working in bronze of Dante's tragedy. Because the figure that you see, if you look right in the center of your screen, the one that we all think of as the thinker, that was supposed to be Dante dreaming up the divine comedy, which was his great grief cry in the middle of death, disgrace, disaster, political corruption. That became his epic poem where he literally wrote his own way out of suicide. The first truly great work of narrative therapy that I know of. He had gone through the death of his beloved muse Beatrice and other friends. He had felt the great grief cry of remorse. He had been placed in exile with a death sentence over his head with everything, everything taken away from him. And out of that place of abject despair, he dreamt up the divine comedy which reached across the centuries to kindle the light of inspiration in Rodin, which reached then to the next generation with Rilke to write the sonnets of Orpheus. And another man in his great depth of grief turned to this as well. This is Wilhelm Adolf Bougereau, a man who lost four children and a wife before he himself died. And it was, this is the great principle of alchemy. Take your story, 
Let your grief cry. Meet another great grief cry. Find a mirror. If you have lost a child, search out other people who have lost a child. If you are in financial ruin, search out other people who are in that same position and have found their way through. If your career has collapsed, take inspiration from those who have reinvented themselves. Remember their stories. And Bougereau, as he was dealing with great death and grief and sorrow and rage, also turned to the story of Dante's Divine Comedy. Here you see Dante and Virgil in the back and this great cry of rage here. But he also knew how to transmute grief. And when he lost his son and his wife was ill with tuberculosis, Bougereau, Bougereau wed his grief cry with another larger grief cry. And he turned to the story of Mary, who had lost her son, who had watched her son suffer and die. And here, what he did is Bougereau painted his own wife, his own wife as the Virgin Mary. It's a very different image than we usually see. Her eyes are red with sorrow. This is a face that is not serene yet, but is haggard with, with tragedy. If you look at this face, you will see a face of grief. This is the masterwork that Bougereau painted. It, he poured his broken heart into his paint. And with every stroke and every tear that he was shedding for his own son, he joined his grief cry with an epic grief cry. But he didn't stop there. This is not the entire picture. Notice what surrounds them. Notice it is the angels of lamentation. It is the community of Taylor and Francis's and Maladoma's grief rituals singing, singing as they mourn. And you can see then that the angels with their hands to their hearts and their wings spread open, create a canopy of love to hold the sorrows, to hold the sorrows. Bougereau painted the faces of the angels in his life the ones who came to offer their songs and consolation and tenderness. I would ask you if this were your painting and maybe some of you who have been through loss recently want to print this out and then want to take pictures of your own faces and your, your dearly beloved's faces and put them here. Who would be your angels? Who would be the faces of those who have sent their, their songs of love to you? When he lost another son, and again, his family was disconsolate in grief. Bougereau painted this picture, the first morning, Adam and Eve lamenting the death of their son, Abel. He knew that if he kept all of the grief inside of him, it would kill him. <laughs> he says, if I can't give myself to my dear painting, I am miserable. But every day, every day, he had the discipline to rise with the sun and go to the studio and pour his broken heart into painting. And in creating that beauty, I imagine I am not alone that in seeing this painting, it touches the grief cry in some of you. And yet strangely in looking at it, there is healing balm. It's the face of our grief that maybe we haven't been able to name. Jim, imagine if this was the painting that you were crying over and you put links at the feet as well. That would give a container for something to happen. Beethoven also knew what it was. He was wrestling with suicide when he discovered he was going deaf. And he had the choice. He, he writes in this famous letter to his brothers called the Heilingstedt Testament, in which he was contemplating suicide. But instead, he turns from the rage of life isn't fair. This isn't right. I'm at the apex of my powers. I've just, I've come through an abusive childhood. I have lived through the death of my own beloved mother. I have gone through all of this. I've been supporting my family since the age of 13. I finally made it. I finally made it. I am now the, the most revered concert pianist in all of Vienna. I am a guest in the houses of nobility. I am at the top. And what comes
what he describes as fate knocking at the door, deafness. He was losing his hearing and the impossible. How can I be a composer? How can I be a composer? I cannot be a performer anymore. I can't conduct a symphony orchestra. I can't hear them. I can't play the piano. They can't hear me. What can I do? Maybe I'll kill myself. But no, what he did is he said, no, I'm going to write a kind of music that no one has ever written before. I am going to not be nice. Haydn, my teacher, he was nice. He was polite. He had the mask on. He was very polite. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take off my mask and I am going to pour my rage into song. And what he created was the fifth symphony. And if you are on the brink of total despair, I invite you to turn out the lights and listen to John Elliott Gardner's performance of that and rage, pound pillows, sob, dance. Because what that song does is it alchemizes grief and it takes us through to tenderness in the slow movement and resolve and determination. It is a song for when you think all is lost. Join your grief with Beethoven's. It might change your world. It changed mine. When I was a child and through my stormy adolescence, this was what got me through. I think it's ironic that both the Germans and the Americans and allied forces use the Fifth Symphony to rally their troops to find courage. It transcends all boundaries. And rage at the unfairness of things can be transmitted again and again and again into beauty if you join your great grief cry with somebody else's. Artemisia Gentileschi knew this when she was raped brutally by a friend of her father's and then subjected to a rape trial in which she was tortured with thumbscrews in order to prove the veracity of her statements. She took her canvas and her paintbrush and she painted, she painted her own face on Mary Magdalene as Mary Magdalene was crying. She painted her own face and her own body and Susanna and the elders being leered at unfairly by the elders this is the original Me Too movement. This is Susanna and the elders. Artemisia's protest at the unfairness and the sexual abuse. This is her own self-portrait after she was tortured as a martyr. She didn't just suffer with it inside. She did something with it. She brought forth what was inside of her. It's her own face she painted as St. Catherine, another woman from history who was tortured and tormented. And it's her own face again that she turned to at the end of her life. Notice this picture of her, even though it has golden locks, it's her face, it's her body, and it's wearing her dress, Mary Magdalene, holding her heart. The image of Mary Magdalene, the woman who was able to stand present at the foot of profound suffering and grief, and yet go all the way to a new morning of hope, a new garden of possibilities. This is Artemisia's painting of it. I invite you to take this posture wherever you may be. Put one hand on your heart and one hand as if you are touching a skull. In many traditions, the Tibetan Buddhist tradition and then the contemplative Benedictine tradition, memento mori, remember we are mortal. But do not forget, do not forget what lives in the memory of your heart of the good, the beautiful and the true. Transmuting grief is an art. It's an art that the photographer Thomas Dodd knows so well. This is the last portrait of his mother as he knew she was dying, 98 years old. And in his great grief, he took her face and he thought, what image do I want to create? And he drew on his deep knowledge of Greek mythology to imagine her here as the crone leading us through the underworld going to the beyond, the great guide. He took the image of his departed mother and he gave honor to it. What can you do with your great grief cry? What can you do with your great grief cry? I want to ask Rick now to play actually a piece of music and then we're going to close.
actually we'll we'll do that the opposite range. I'm sorry, Doug. Would you would you recite the po a poem, and then I'll introduce Last Touch. I would love to. Uh, from 13th century Spain. These are the words of a levy of Rome. It's for those who have died, these we remember. He said, tis a fearful thing to love what death can touch. To love, to hope, to dream, and oh, to lose. A thing for fools, this love, but a holy thing to love what death can be. Mm. For your life has lived in me, your words have lifted me, your laugh was a gift to me. To remember this brings painful joy. Tis a human thing, love. Oh, what to remember that we are mortal. This is the thing that all the spiritual traditions call us to wake up to and that we are being called to wake up to right now. Rilke wrote, how human beings squander their pain. How we squander our pain. What instead if we didn't squander this time? If we didn't frit our, our days away with things that don't bring us back to our better selves. But instead, we told each other. We took off our masks on Zoom. And we told each other, this is what you have meant to me. This is what I wish I could have done for you. I will always remember this about you. You don't know because I never told you, but there was this time where I was down and you were my light. What if this was the giving of thanks at the table this week? And what if in this time of seclusion that we could turn our hearts to honoring both those who have died and those who are still with us? You know, we're not all a Thomas Dodd, but there are things that we can do. You can sit around a virtual table and tell your favorite stories of hope and courage, especially those of your ancestors. You can tell the stories of your personal heroes and heroines. You can create a book of memories for each person for Christmas to say these, to, to gather the pictures, make a little video to write letters of gratitude this week, to think about the teachers and friends who have made a difference in your life. Maybe even write them, even if they've died. This is what Taylor and I and Francis do at the grief rituals. I wish I had told you, I never got to tell you. To write that and then to read those aloud. And then my favorite new idea is to plant a memory garden. Inspired by the Miwok people of the land where I now live, they had a name for every tree. In this holiday season, I'm going to go and plant a flower, plant a tree for each person that I've lost that I love and write their name on a rock and think about the beauty of the memories of them. And if they're still around and you're lucky enough that that is the case, then perhaps, perhaps you can reach out and tell them and take a picture of it and send it to them. Before we end with the song, I just want to invite you to other things that are coming because this really is just the beginning. And in the days to come, there will be more in depth of these stories, including the stories of Beethoven and Rumi, a series that starts on Saturday with Ubiquity University of Odes to Joy that will include Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, Art, Music, and Poetry. And then also a whole series on the arts of grief, which is going to be in the chat box. And finally, I want to encourage you that you can go online to something called a labyrinth locator. Here is the link. And one of the most powerful practices I know is to search out or make a labyrinth 
I know that my beloved Carl and I will be making a labyrinth very soon to honor this. And the most meaningful walk of my life has been the walk that I took at Shark Cathedral when everything else went wrong. The music wasn't supposed to, that was supposed to be there went wrong. The light was wrong. Everything was wrong. And as a way of trying to make it right, I thought, well, I'm just going to remember with every step something I'm grateful for. And I thought I might run out before the labyrinth was over, but I was wrong. Because gratitude, as Brother David, David Stendhal Ross and others teach us, is a practice, a skill, a capacity that we can build. So with every step, a new story, a new face came to mind. Even people whose names I've forgotten, like the crossing guard when I was seven years old, who held the umbrella over me in the rain and waited for me the day that my mom was delayed in a traffic jam. I don't know her name, but my heart remembers now. So search out a labyrinth somewhere or just go for a walk in the woods and remember what you're grateful for. And as an invitation into that practice, just for the next three minutes, I want to invite you to get out a piece of paper and a pen. And as this piece of music that I wrote is played, I want to invite you to remember it's called Last Touch because it was inspired by a poem by Ellen Bass. Imagine that you were the last person, she invites us, to touch someone. How would you touch them? I went and the last, and I played this song the last time I saw my father as he was dying of brain cancer. I couldn't touch him later on with my hands, but I could play this song for him. And it's the song that he listened to as he lay dying. Rick, would you play this now for us? And everyone listening, I just invite you in the chat box or in journaling to write the memories of something that you're grateful for, a moment of beauty and goodness and love.
There is still beauty each day. There is still love, if only in our hearts. Connect to the memory of what is good, what is beautiful, what is true. And let your great grief cry pour forth, pour forth in story, in song, in letters of appreciation and lamentation. The power of the arts teaches us it is medicine for your soul and healing balm for the world. Don't squander your pain. Bring forth what is inside of you. If we all bring forth the beauty that is inside of us, it will save the world. To you, Jim. Thank you, Kayleen. You know, it's some deep mystery how music can so powerfully draw forth emotions. In many cases, we don't even know we have. I was sitting here listening attentively and then when the music began to play, it was as if my soul dropped an octave and my heart began to feel uh, the depth of grief at a level that my mind wasn't attentive to as I was following uh, the discussion. And so I just want to acknowledge you and Taylor and Doug uh, for your um, depth of, of wisdom today. You know, grief is one of those deep emotions that stay hidden almost worldwide. You know, we, we acknowledge anger, uh, righteousness, pride, aggressiveness. We celebrate certain emotions. We talk about love, but we really aren't sure what it means and we're afraid to really express it. But then when you get into those deeper recesses of the psyche where there is sorrow and there's grief and there's trauma. Somehow we instinctively cover those because we're in a world that uses weakness to exploit. And the stories that you told of uh, Beethoven and, and others and the, the agony that they went through in their inner selves to produce the greatness that we celebrate without grief. It took grief to create that genius. And we do it a disservice by forgetting that it was born of grief. You know, and I thought of something that's said about Jesus in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, that he was a, a man of who learned obedience through what he suffered. And I thought of the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Jesus wept before entering the city, knowing that he was coming to his last time. He gazed upon the city of Jerusalem and he wept. And then in Gethsemane, he sweated drops of blood. We think of him as a paragon of perfection. Like Beethoven, we think of his just great genius, and he just wrote the fifth, wrote the ninth, <laughs> and just wrote just somehow they just do it. But we don't honor because we don't understand that the cauldron yes. of emotions and the willingness of these great souls amongst us to 
to deeply honor those vulnerabilities. Uh, in fact, understanding that it is in the, the, the amalgamation of those darker recesses of the psyche um, mixed with our wildest and highest aspirations and dreams that you can fashion the fifth or the ninth symphonies, that you can hang on the cross and say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And if everything had gone right for Dante, we would never remember him. And if Beethoven had kept being a fantastic concert pianist, we would have forgotten him as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I just want to thank you all and, and just encourage all of us, particularly now, given the world situation, given the holidays coming up. You know, we're in this complexio oppositorum where we're entering the holidays, where we're celebrating the light at the time of the greatest darkness, and we're all under siege by the pandemic, by social distancing. And I'm sure many of you have had people that you know who have died of COVID. Uh, and, um, and in uh, El Paso, Texas, it was reported yesterday that the National Guard has been called out to assist with the mortuaries because there's literally no place to put the bodies of the dead in a major American city. Imagine that. And I think what we've taken from these last two sessions, everyone, and Kayleen, thank you for your extraordinary elegance and graciousness and Doug, the pathos of your poetry and Taylor, just the the depth of your insight. I just want to just honor that this is a field unplumbed by most, and you've brought great light. So uh, thank you for doing that. And uh, for those of you, um, I just want to acknowledge also uh, Sylvia Lingen in the chat, uh, who was talking about the passing of her mother um, with great love, and Paula Petrie, uh, who lost her daughter. And Paula wrote an autobiography. She went through a catharsis uh, with a mother's courage to awaken. It's a powerful book. Uh, I've read it and I uh, would recommend it to anyone who's lost a loved one, particularly a child. That's one of the hardest griefs to bear. No parent should have to mourn their own children. So uh, thank you for sharing these things. Uh, take the time um, to grieve. Take the time to transmute the grief into some form of celebration, uh, which will vitalize uh, your soul. Uh, so thank you. Uh, we will now bring it to a close uh, tomorrow. Uh, we will move on to the great dialogues that David Bohm had with Krishnamurti. Remember the great physicist uh, there at Princeton with Albert Einstein, who came up with some alternative theories and was expelled, uh, including by Einstein, who wouldn't stand by David Baum's radical reinterpretation of cosmology and this heretical notion that it was all one. And he ended up traveling around, uh, met Krishnamurti, had some extraordinary dialogues um, uh, uh, with Krishnamurti that uh, Peter Mary and Mick uh, Dabushia are going to discuss uh, tomorrow. And this is worth just noting. The greatest physicist in the world, Albert Einstein, did not understand the most fundamental truth about the cosmos, that it was all 
one. And that everything is interconnected in such an entanglement that perturbations in one aspect are refracted through all other aspects. That's what David Bohm understood. And the scientific establishment refused to understand. And of course, it's David Bohm who in the end had the deeper insight. So tomorrow we're going to explore that whole uh, dimension. Uh, and then uh, Wednesday, we're going to go deeper into that interconnectivity by looking with Joe Truss on the geometric structures of the universe. It's going to be a powerful next two days. And it was very, very illuminating to start with the matter of grief. So thank you, everyone. And the, the um, uh, chat, the link for the after session chat uh, will be up uh, in a moment. And we invite all of you to uh, join. And we'll see you again tomorrow, uh, 5 o'clock PM Central European time here on Humanity Rising. Thank you, everyone. And Kayleen, Doug, Taylor, thank you. Bye, everyone.